2 John in verse 5. The Bible says, Now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not in your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full and the children of thy elect sister greet thee, amen. And so we saw again and again in our study of 1 John that there were three tests or three evidences of true Christianity. There was a doctrinal test. In other words, fidelity to what the apostles taught about Jesus Christ. And then there was a moral test. In other words, a love for God's commands, a walking in accordance to the scripture. And then there was a social or a relational test or a real and tangible expression of love and care and concern on the part of believers for other believers. Christians are truly loving and caring for their fellow Christians. And the apostle John expands this last test in the second epistle of John, basically as a test against false teachers in his own time and also in our time. In verses 5 and 6, he talks about the moral test of love and obedience. In verses 7 through 11, he talks about the doctrinal test and what the church believes about the person and work of Jesus Christ. In verses 12 and 13, he goes back to that issue of fellowship, of mutual love and expression and concern for one another. And so if you remember last week, John started the book in verse 1, he addressed what he was writing to the elect lady. And so here in verse 5, he says, And now I beseech thee, lady. Of course, the lady being the church at Ephesus. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we from had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. And so John is calling us not to a new commandment, but to obey an old one. And that's to love one another, an exhortation to real Christian love and an explanation of the relation of love and law in the Christian life. And he's speaking about love and he relates it to the law. He says it's the law of love. He says it's, a, it's not a new commandment, it's an old one. He's saying that, that love is the law. And he gives an exhortation in verses 5 and 6 to a real, genuine Christian love. And he says that love and obedience are the Christian life. And John is speaking to an issue that is a real issue for Christians today. Because so many people today believe that Christianity is not a call to obedient discipleship. But people think that Christianity is just supposed to be freedom from the law, freedom from obligation, you know, because we live under grace, we don't have to worry about the law. And if anybody tries to put anything like rules in the Christian life, they're just called a legalist, they're, you know. Um, but what John is telling us is that love and the law are the two elements of the Christian life. And specifically, he tells us to obey what he calls the command of love. And that is not a contradiction. And he tells us that as he, as he tells us to obey this commandment of love, he reminds us it's not a new commandment. In other words, John didn't invent the commandment to love one another. It came from Jesus. And even when Jesus gave it, he said, this is not a new commandment. Jesus was simply taking something that Moses had already taught because Moses had taught us to love one another. Moses had already emphasized that we love our neighbor as ourselves. 
And so in the upper room, when Jesus said a new commandment, I give unto you that you love one another, he was actually referencing Moses. The commandment itself wasn't new, but what was new was the ethical standard that he was placed upon it. Because he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. In other words, the command to love one another wasn't a new one, even for Jesus. But the level he was placing it at was new because he said, as I have loved you. That was new. Because Jesus in his own life and ministry and death had provided for us the measure of what real love was. Moses told us to love one another, but he never really set the standard of what love was. Jesus was saying, I'm doing that. In other words, I'm giving my life for you. You love one another in the same way. He'd shown them love as he washed their feet in the upper room. He'd shown them love as, uh, as he was about to be crucified. He'd shown them love as he'd sweat great drops of blood. He was going to show them love when he hung upon the cross. And he was saying, that's how I want you to love one another. And so in verse 5, John could say we had from the beginning that we love one another. In other words, John is saying there's never been a day in your Christian discipleship when you didn't know that you were called to obey the great commandment. In other words, because Jesus is your Savior. He said, love one another as I've loved you. And so John and Jesus both calling us to a costly service for one another, a real and tangible love and care and concern. Look at verse six. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. That's an interesting way to describe love. John is saying that love is to live God's commandments. And God's great command is, of course, to love. And so John's not saying anything new here. He's just repeating the words of Jesus. But what did Jesus say in Matthew twenty two forty? He said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. And so again, we hear that Christianity is not about rules. And it is about a lot more than rules. It's about the person of Jesus. It's about the gospel. It's about the power of the spirit. It's about the glory of the triune God. But that doesn't change the fact that there are rules. And so God's law is not our enemy once we've been brought under grace. Rather, God's law becomes our friend as we live under grace. And so Christianity is not just about rules, but to just say, oh, Christianity is not about rules doesn't do justice to the new commandment because love is actually one of the rules. Jesus didn't say, love one another as I've loved you, if you feel like it. Love one another as I've loved you, if you're having a good day. Love one another as I've loved you, uh, because you want to, not because you have to. He just said, love one another as I've loved you. In other words, that's a commandment. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so for those who preach that Christianity is about love and not about the law, they don't have either. Because if you do away with the law, there's no basis for love. Remember, we talked about that last week, the week before, that truth is the basis of love. You know, I've done my best not to comment on certain people in a certain place these last several months. But there's a reason why the self-proclaimed leadership of a place whose name I will not mention cannot even give testimony of their own salvation, let alone lead anybody else to Jesus. It's why they hated Bible preaching. Because for all of their talk about love, they've separated love from the law, and so they have neither. Love is the law, and the law is love. You can't separate those two. And to do that is to preach a false gospel. It's not the apostles' teaching. It's not what Jesus taught and preached. 
In other words, Christians are to love as an act of glad and joyful and grateful and willing obedience to God's word. We're to live in accordance to God's word and obey his commands, and that's how we express our love to him. And so are we walking in accordance with God's word? If we are, we're walking in love. And are you walking in love? Then you're walking in accordance with God's word. And if you're walking in accordance with God's word, you're walking in love. They're they're the same. People try to separate those things, but they go hand in hand. Look at verse 7. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. And so John encourages us to continue in the truth about Jesus, the truth that Jesus taught his disciples the truth, that the disciples proclaimed to the world the truth, which was inscripturated in the Old Testament. Inscripturated, I made up a word, inscripturated. But the truth that was being revealed as the New Testament was being given. And here John defines deceivers. He calls believers, he warns believers to watchfulness And he reviews the procedure for dealing with those who deny the truth about Jesus. And so in verse 7, he says, for many deceivers are entered into the world. He's just echoing, again, what Jesus said. Jesus said there would be deceivers. He said there would be false teachers. He said there would be false messiahs. Had a conversation with Brother Allen a couple weeks ago. Maybe about a month ago now. In fact, it was a conversation we were having at the men's breakfast. So that gives you a window of how long ago it was. And I was sharing with him my discouragement over the fact that there are so many churches that have pastors that don't even believe the basic tenets of the Christian faith. But yet, as I've been looking here this past week, I'm reminded that Jesus told us that was going to happen. The Lord said that there would be false teachers. And so again, in verse 7, we see that these false teachers will come and that they will attack the very heart of the faith itself, that they'll confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh. In other words, they call into question what Jesus said about himself. They call into question what the apostles had preached and wrote about Jesus. They call into question the Bible's very testimony about who Jesus was. And in verse seven, John calls them deceivers. And he says, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. In verse 8, he warns Christians to be on guard against the deception of these teachers, lest we become spiritual losers. And he talks about all the things that we lose if, if we believe these false teachings, these deceptions. And then in verse 9, he goes even further and he says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And so these false teachers, they claim to take you to new truth. They say, we're going to leave behind the old ways and we're going to show you something that's really new, something really deep, something really profound, something that's better, something that's more compelling to the world. And John is saying, when you go beyond the truth of Jesus, you not only lose Jesus, you lose the Father too. You know what amazes me? How many people want God, but they don't want Jesus. They want a spiritual blessing but they want to find it in another way other than in Jesus. And so John is saying you cannot have the Father apart from the Son. And it's not just Jesus, or not just John saying it, Jesus had said it. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. The apostles preached it in the book of Acts. They said there's no other name under heaven whereby a man can be saved. In other words, they weren't making up some narrow-minded, bigoted exclusivism. They were simply repeating what Jesus had taught them. And so John says, you move past that, guess what? You move right past Christianity itself. And you haven't found God, you've lost God, because Jesus is the only way to God. 
Unless you think that Gnosticism was a first century thing. Say, well, yeah, John was talking about a first century heresy. Nobody preaches that stuff anymore. Have you ever heard of the Jesus Seminar? Or that fatso Pentecostal preacher on TV, John Hagee? I heard John Hagee, the last time I heard John Hagee preach, he literally said that Jews will be saved without the Messiah. He said that, that the Jews can come to the Father without Jesus. That they can reject Jesus as Messiah, but be a faithful Jew and still be saved. And so the same heresy that was being preached in John's day is being preached on television today. Joel Osteen. I heard him on CNN years ago. He told Larry King, he said that he believed that people didn't need Jesus to be saved. Larry King asked him point blank if a person can go to heaven without accepting Jesus or if they had to accept Jesus. It was a point blank question from Larry King. And Joel Osteen said something to the effect of, well, if they live a good life, then, then you know, yeah, God will accept them. So again... That first century heresy being preached on American television. Franklin Graham has been accused of preaching the same. Now, I've not heard Franklin Graham say that, so I'm not going to lay that accusation on him. But I am going to say I have heard that he has said similar things. Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. George W. Bush, I did hear him say on television that one can be saved without believing the gospel. That was in the 2004 presidential debate, but Bush is an Episcopalian, so we'll give him a pass. Jimmy Carter, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, they were all Southern Baptists. They should have known better. But yet they've all proclaimed salvation without Jesus. And in fact, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter are all alumni of the Jesus Seminar. And so John is speaking about precisely what the Jesus Seminar is teaching, that Christianity is not the only way. The, the Jesus Seminar teaches that the Christian church invented a Jesus who was different from the original Jesus. And, and I'm sorry, but the Jesus Seminar doesn't know more about the original Jesus than the apostle who leaned on his breast during the Last Supper did. Or the apostles who lived with him for three and a half years, who wrote down everything that he said the people who worshipped him and ultimately gave their lives for him. I'm sorry, Al Gore, but Jesus was not an inspiring prophet who taught us to protect the environment and join the Sierra Club. He was the only way to the Father. He was the living God in the flesh. And John says if you move past Jesus' own teaching about himself, you move past uh, the apostles' teaching about Jesus if you move past the Bible's claims about Jesus, then you've just moved right past Christianity. It's not a new revelation. It's an old heresy. And that's what John's speaking of. And in verse 10, he gives a very stern warning. He says, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. And if you think that this is a contradiction to what he said a moment ago about how you're supposed to love one another, as Christians, we can have fellowship with Christians that we have disagreements with because we have a commonality in Jesus, but you don't have fellowship with those who deny Jesus. And so they're not fellow believers. There's no basis for love there. Again, truth is the foundation of love. And so John's saying, don't even let them into your house. He's saying, don't even have fellowship with them. Don't even eat with them. In verse 12, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. And so John ends with an exhortation, a concluding remark about the importance of corporate Christian fellowship. He reminds us that the fullness of joy is experienced only as we fellowship with other believers. 
And there was a lot that John could have written here. There was probably a lot that needed to be said, but he was hoping to know the joy of face-to-face fellowship with them. And he's like, you know what? I'll wait and I'll tell you when I'm with you. I actually wrote these notes uh, weeks ago. So Alan's going to listen to this later today or tomorrow, and he's going to think I'm digging at him, and I'm not. You know, so many people think they can just worship God on their own if they don't need to come to church. And my favorite one through the years has always been, that, well, I'm fishing, or I'm out in nature, and I'm communing with God. But John is reminding us that there's no experience of the fullness of joy in the Christian life without the fellowship of other believers, without gathering around the Lord's word on the Lord's day, without fellowshipping with one another, without encouraging one another to love and good works. That God intended us to grow in grace, but he didn't intend for us to do it apart from one another. We can only do it when we're with one another. And so John longs to be with this church and with these brethren. And then I love the greeting here. It says, and don't I just... The children of thy elect sister greet thee, in verse 13. I mean, what a great way for one church to to send a greeting or a blessing to another church. And that greeting rests on the union that we have with one another in Jesus, and it expresses the need for fellowship. And so John has three important words for us today. He says, you love God, you're a Christian. And so you're going to love his word and you're going to love his commands and you're going to know that his commands are love and you're a Christian and you're going to love Jesus and not just the Jesus of men's opinions, not just the Jesus invented by this sect or that cult, not just Jesus reduced down to human proportions by brilliant scholars like they do in the Jesus seminar, but you're going to love the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of the gospels. You're a Christian, you're going to fellowship with other believers who believe that same Bible and who believe in that same Jesus and who want to live in accordance with that word and with his commands. And you're not going to have fullness of joy unless you're in fellowship with them. And so may God bless our fellowship today and our fellowship with one another. And Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you'll bless our fellowship and that you'll bless the food that we're about to enjoy in fellowship together. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.